Today's podcast is sponsored by us. We have our very own merch featuring some sensational designs inspired by our channel logo, my favorite being the one that I've got on. You can get it on t-shirts, hoodies, on your phone case, and in all kinds of different colors if you want to get more creative than I did with mine. So if you want to flaunt your Elder Scrolls loving pride and help support our podcast, you can find a link to our merch in the description below. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Fudge Muppet. This is episode 5 of the Elder Scrolls podcast, and today we are talking all about Akavir. And yeah, so we're going to go through the four races, I think. We'll talk about dragons as well later, but and we'll talk about all their relevant history as we go. But let's start off with the Sayesi. The snake people, the vampiric snake people. And is that 100% con uh, confirmed how to pronounce it? Because I've heard people say Saisi, I've heard Saisi. I always I said Saisi, but I'm fairly sure ESO confirmed it as Saisi. I think, mm, yeah. Yeah, I like Saisi. They all that, sound that, very, you know, slivery. Yeah, so. I mean, I can yeah. roll with that. I think... I think this race is probably the most interesting race or at least the most confusing race with a lot of controversy and different theories and opinions on them compared to all of the other races, I guess, even if they... They get the most attention. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. I mean, they've got all the Akaviri culture and stuff that you see even in terms of like the architecture and whatnot with the blades. But I guess the biggest thing around them is uh, what are they? Are they snakes? Are they men? Are they humans? Are they a bit half half? What do we think, guys? Well, um, we could we'll, let, let's start. It might be good to start them off with the actual um, mysterious Akavir description because this is the source. Mysterious Akavir is the source for pretty much all of the races, and then some of the others have extra bits to them from other sources. But so it says. Sayesi is Snake Palace, once the strongest power in Akavir before the Tiger Dragon came. The Serpent Folk ate all the men of Akavir a long time ago, but still kind of look like them. They are tall, beautiful, if frightening, covered in golden scales. And immortal. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right, right. Um, Yeah, so that, there you go. They've got their little... There's a little bit more, but that's the description, essentially. So, I reckon... like. The, ser the serpent folk, for most people, and whenever someone calls something like serpentine, they imagine a long tail, like a snake, or a, literally a serpent kind of thing. So the conventional, um, typical sort of idea was that it was a snake tail, like the, the bottom half is a snake. And that's kind of what the historical fiction um, in-game, 2920, the last year of the first era, it's a series, and it's all about the end of the Riemann dynasty and the potentates and so on and the potentates and his um son they're described as slithering and with like they then they, they can't wear conventional armor and so on and it gives you the idea that it's a snake whereas a lot of the other evidence we have um kind of points in the opposite direction and then also that um it is a historical fiction as well piece. Like it could be an embellishment for the past. So oh, it absolutely like, could be. I mean, to be honest, I originally thought that the Saiesi would kind of, and I don't now, but originally thought they could look kind of like the, I don't know how to pronounce it, but the Lamia or Lamaya, you know, the big amphibious yeah. beast folk that you can find in Elder Scrolls Online. Like there's different types all over the place. But especially if you look, there's actually one in Daggerfall and it really does just look like a, I guess a mermaid, but instead of like a fish tail, it's a big snake body. Yeah. And you can kind of imagine I that. But then I kind of progressed to thinking of them more. And I think this sounds a lot cooler than them just looking like men, but kind of like uh, men, but with slightly more serpentine facial features, only in the sense that like, you know how Bredens are meant to look more elvish, even though in game they mm. kind of don't. Yeah, just like slightly more, you know, just around the face or like little like bits Like gaunt and features and narrow eyes and maybe like thin lips and yeah. sort of... Yeah, you know how an elf, uh, an elf, when you make them a vampire in the Dawnguard DLC, will get that really like bat appearance, but they're still... You yeah. can still tell like you're a dark elf or whatever. <clears throat> kind of like uh, maybe a less enhanced version of that, but a snake version on like a manish race. Yeah, well, it's interesting that they actually do say in the Mysterious Akavir that they ate the races of men mm. long ago. But if you actually look at the book, the annotated annuad, 
it says it refers to the um, old Elnafe and wandering Elnafe. So that's like the precursors to the races of elves and men. And for the wandering Elnafe, it even it explicitly states them as men because it's talking about like the Nords of Etmora, Red Guards of of um, Yakuda, and the Sayesi of Akavir, which also which you know what I mean. Like that's a and you know that's one book as well. But when you start to combine that with the fact that a they're all said to have kneeled mm. to Riemann during his invasion, so I guess um, I don't know, Drew. Do you want to talk about the invasion? Well, yeah, yeah. F- well, I was going to say yeah. anyway that I think realistically them having perfectly humanoid figures makes the most sense when you look at their entire involvement with Tamriel and the Imperials because it just it just fits. But then again, but like I'll talk about the invasion in one second, but there's actually Lawrence Schick, the former lawmaster for ESO. This this is kind of a retcon, but he essentially said they might have shape-shifting ability, so that might be why people saw them as actual snakes. Um, and why they're described fighting in certain ways, but yeah, but yeah, yeah, go Th- on, and then I'll talk about the invasion. S- s- yeah, sorry, I was just saying that um, it's interesting. There's this, there's a character in ESO which I guess we can talk about a little bit in a little bit, but shedding skin comes up, and that kind of like plays on that idea of shape shifting and so on. That they could kind of maybe they do change body. It's the same person, but they can kind of like you know what I mean, and it, it, it's fits with the snake theme because if you want to talk a little bit more about the the snake vampiric theme that they've got going on like um there is also you know in shivering isles the sword dawn fang or dusk fang that's what they call like an akaviri blood drinker sword which sort of fits in with that theme again like the blood drinking and they're said to you know have goblins and stuff that they in um this is in the mysterious akavir it says that they go and use them for blood and, and, and stuff like that. Like this vampire sort of thing is... I don't think it's not related to Molag Bal, but it's vampiric in the sense of like life draining to, mm. you know... So, so when you look at life. the idea of the, the Sayesi eating men, I, I, I personally see it less like, you know, a snake literally engulfing a man having a giant, you know, like they're distended from eating them, but rather just them becoming, whether they became it or whether they always were, like being a vampiric race that feasts on blood you can that that's kind of the eating i that's how i interpret it imagine if it was some kind of i mean it doesn't really work with the goblins but imagine if it was some kind of like form assuming thing so as a race they go in there they're feeding on all of the men but as they do they kind of are like taking on their Mm. appearance like through the blood like their dna kind of thing and also that adds to why they would try and eat all the dragons it was said that the Sayasi tried to eat all the dragons because mm. they want to take on this powerful form and so on and then that also adds extra stuff about them coming to Cyrodiil and sort of interbreeding with the Imperials and so on and being part of that culture it's like maybe there are like Sayasi still around but they're kind of like you know what I mean like they're taking on other forms yeah, yeah. I was just about to say that like that idea sounds really cool just, just like a form assuming race so whatever they are now is just kind of looking like the thing they most recently devoured plus an amalgamation of all the things they devoured before that yeah like it, it it does sound well it makes sense cool. of why they'd fit in so well in such an alien culture because we'll talk about the potentate soon but the idea you know that there's been some weird people who've sat on the ruby throne over the over the history of uh tamriel but if if there were literal snake men you know like actual physical snakes ruling the imperials it would it would seem a little bit weird whereas if they kind of are very similar to the imperials by being around them and they kind of take on the shape of men it it seems more fitting with the kind of people who'd rule the empire as well yeah absolutely um i think ultimately though if we had to give you a final answer um i would say that they probably humanoid in shape we don't know if they have like scales or serpentine features or or whatnot um, we've seen some descendants of these characters and that have got Akaviri blood admixture and um, they look closer to Imperials, but that could just be because it's bred out. But the other thing is all of the ghosts, the Sayasi ghosts in both ESO and Oblivion have um, legs, like not the snake bottom half. Um, there's like in that mission in the pale pass um in oblivion there is a there's a letter from like a messenger or something an akaviri messenger and it re- it references something about breaking a leg 
um, like one of the Akaviri breaks their leg or, or a reference to, um, and like we said before, like kneeling before Riemann and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Also, if you look at Alduin's wall, they're depicted as humanoid form Akaviri invaders again. And I mean, the dragon guard themselves built Alduin's wall. So it's kind of, yeah. do you know what I mean? Oh, for, so for I, sure, I feel for sure. Yeah. I was also going to say though, like weirder things in the Elder Scrolls universe have happened as we always say. And if you look at all of the races on Tamriel, because we know so much about them, they all tend to be involved with like a higher power of some sort, you know, like where they're descended from, who they pray from, who they draw power from, whether it's the Argonians and the Hist or the Khajiit and their moons and whatever, right? We, we don't know what the Sayesi kind of are involved with higher up. And if you look at the Bosma of Valenwood, they have the wild hunt, like they have this power where they literally can shape shift into all these like crazy things. Who knows if the Saiyasi are kind of humanoid and then just, you know, go super saiyan and like get all these kind of like snake-like features, like the scales come on and make their skin tough and they get like, you know, all these other things temporarily. And all the time that we've seen them anyway, or Tamrielic people have seen them is often in combat situations anyway, right? So mm. in those, t maybe. It's just a theory. I'm do, just coming you know up what? with it, stuff. It, yeah, no, I kind, I, I kind of like that theory to sort of reconcile all those ideas. I kind of like the idea. Do you remember in Dragon Ball Z, you know, Cell? Mm -hmm. Like, it's kind of like that. Like him just sucking in people and taking on their like DNA and then he can use their stuff to like have a it's, chosen It's just form. Kirby, as Drew would say. <laughs> or Kirby. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why yeah. Yeah. You love Kirby. Yeah, but Kirby's not quite as uh, intimidating... Of a character, no. as maybe the CR. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it, well, since we're talking about biology, still, um, there is a descendant of the Dragon Guard. Well, sorry, he was a member of the Dragon Guard, but um, long lived. Um, Chevalier Renald, and he um, he's got like Sayesi blood, right? Um, but. What's interesting is he has a line which is... I'm just going to find it one second. Is this where he says he too will shed his skin? And that the Akaviri yeah, dragon so, guard shed their old skins and were reborn in the service of the Empire? Yeah, so he says, We shed our skins and arose reborn in the service of his Empire and the Coiled King. I'll shed this skin as well when it's time for a new beginning. Now, that reference to me is we shed our old skins... In, um, and a rosary born in service of his empire and the Quilled King. But I'm pretty sure it's referencing Riemann there. So when they came and invaded and so on, they shed their old skins, their old sort of like identity. Um, it, this could just be poetic, mm. but it could also be quite literal that they actually did. And then they you know, shed their skins and then knelt to Riemann and then in service of his new empire. And then I'll shed this skin as well when it's time for a new beginning. Um, and that's actually in reference to what happens later. He actually finds... Well, then this guy's long-lived because he lives until the end of the Second Era. Um, he finds uh, Kulakane, who is Emperor Zero, who was the guy who was going to be Emperor before Tiber Septim, you know, had him <laughs> stabbed in the neck. Or, or no, he just died because of a Breton Nightblade. But, you know, depends what you think about that theory. But basically, um, Tiber Septim replaced him and then Chevalier followed type of septum but um it's an interesting concept and you know maybe he's around today and he's just shed his skin and become a you know maybe a new name it, or it kind of reminds me of Statocarl a little bit you know like the the red yeah. god well the yakutan and red guard gods and stuff when they talk about shedding their skin and all that because i recently when i was doing the flesh magic video i was looking at the the um hollow-faced men of nohotogra and all of that in terms of like Galafil working with them and how they're known or people are known Sardaukar worshippers to be rolling sidewinder fashion in the desert in mile stretches all the way to that oasis specifically and whether or not she worked with them to learn about you know skin magic literally shedding skin off a face but it it does make me wonder kind of what gods or deities that the Sayesi are involved with that, that's just what it makes me think of I really want to know yeah, well, there's we got a little bit in ESO that was added that I'll find. Yeah, so um, that these are, so let's for context for how we're getting this CSE information. So after the whole, um, I'm pretty sure it was straight after the whole deal with 
Well, we, we should explain, explain this chronologically. So, um, the Akaviri invasion. So, they show up towards the end of the first era. And um, they're going on a rampage. But then Riemann stops them at Pale Pass. And he's declared Dragonborn. They all kneel before him because apparently they were looking for him. And then um, they get integrated into into the Empire, the Sayasi, these Akaviri people. And, and then that has a profound effect on the culture um, in regards to the Imperial, uh, Imperial Legion and their formations and all that kind of stuff, as well as obviously the Akaviri Dragon Guard. Um, but then, and also uh, the Fighters Guild, which we can also talk about that one of the potentates put in. But at one point, what happens, once that kind of whole Akaviri deal crumbles, a bunch of those men, uh, sorry, those Akaviri characters, Sayasi and so on, um, they sort of flee Cyrodiil and then they go in different, go off different areas all over the place. But one place is actually Rimmon in elsewhere, Khajiit. And apparently the name Rimmon comes from Rim Men. And that also, by the way, <laughs> comes from... Yeah, I know. It sounds a little <laughs> funny, actually. <laughs> Please tell I us more, Scott. Myself. Tell us more. <laughs> yeah, tell us, yeah but, but basically, the word men there also implies that they were like more humanoid in form, like actual men. But that's the name for what the, the Khajiit called them. Um, and so they actually had a bit of a Akaviri culture. They, they ended up getting sort of interbred with Imperials and so on um, for a while. But the Khajiit... And as of the second era, there's a, like a little settlement called Hakoshe. And um, they basically have Akaviri traditions and stuff going on that they've maintained and kept. And this is how we know that there is, um, they have ancestor worship is part of it. But apparently four deities, at least four deities symbolizing different elements. Like Ilni, which is like weather, air. Min, which is sun, fire. Nifa, which is earth and Zisa, which is oceans and water. Um, and we know like, so that doesn't not much to go off and that sounds like just the elements. So there's a lot to, to work with there, but there's one other God that Zen, which is, I'm pretty sure it's a Bosma, um, mm. but it's yeah, Bosma, Mary God of toil and vengeance. But some people say that it's come from both Akaviri and Argonian cultures. And interestingly, the only little, there's a little serpentine or at least, imp, um, what do you call it? Uh, reptilian link between the Akaviri, well, the Sayasi and the Argonians. And if it's said to have originated from there, like, I don't know, maybe it's something to do with like cold blood or something. I don't know. But then there's also like supposedly Zen was a deity of, of the Kothringi, which were like a type of man kind of thing. Anyway, it's basically a god that's connected to Xenathar and so on, but... That's the only like little inkling of a, oh, maybe it's from Akavi, but I don't know when it would have come in. Unless it came in during the invasions, but that's quite late in the history, like, you know, 2,700 something years into recorded history that it came about, but it's entirely possible. Um, but uh, yeah, did you, did either, who, who's the uh, professional fighters guild? Um, oh, by the way, that was a question. McFlurry, I'll just shout him out. He was just asking <laughs> what gods, if any, do the people of Akavi worship. So there's that. Um, here's another actual little spot to quickly talk about is um, that I think it's in the book from memory, The Children of the Sky, that it references um, the Akaviri swordsmen who have a ki which is the short shout, like, you know, karate, yeah, like yeah, the, yeah. Huh, huh, yeah. like that. And, but that's like their kind of sound magic as part of a thing. So like that they've got some kind of special power similar to the thumb that they do like. <laughs> huh. Yeah. So I yeah, slightly it. more, <laughs> you know, badass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's also interesting. And I, beyond that, I think that's just a little like, tidbit i don't know how much there is to really speculate about that but it could be pretty crazy if i mean it's making me think of like naruto with all their like ninja powers and stuff because you as we know with the thumb the applications of it are huge like fire breath soul tearing all kinds of stuff where if it was like with ki um they uh they could have a similar sort of range of abilities um I feel I, I feel like the Elder Scrolls writers took a lot of inspiration from Japan when they did Akavir and also Yakuta. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's kind of like Akavir is really just the the fantasy Asia. Yeah, even with the races too. It's like, a big kung fu but, panda like continent, mm. and they're all like, oh, yeah. 
Although, what a, although, what a sell. to be fair, without knowing much <laughs> about Tamriel, you could say similar things about, you know, you've got like the Khajiit there and stuff. But I guess the monkeys is what puts the icing on the cake for Akavir. Yeah. And um, the snakes, I guess. There's snakes, isn't there, in, in Kung Fu Panda? Like the snake Kung Fu? Yeah, I think, I think though. So. Yeah, the viper or something. Yeah, there, like there's a... something there. And there's, and there's Jack Black in it as well. <laughs> like, he's in Akavir as oh, well. Yeah. But then you've got tigers, you know, um, the tigers and the monkeys. It's all, like, very heavy yeah, in their yeah. culture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does someone want to take... So, the Akaviri invasion, um, that happens, right? We, we've yeah, sort well, of one One thing that, about that but... invasion to keep in mind is, like... Um, it does. It does seem very clear that when they say they were searching for Riemann rather than properly invading... It's supported by the fact that they pretty much just tore across, like, straight from the north, straight to the Pale Pass, pretty much. They didn't really try to establish, you know, like, try to build it up as their own nation before spreading out. It wasn't like a proper, you know, like, this is now our home. This was just, like, it does seem like they were really just yeah. looking for the Dragonborn. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, yeah, so that so they end up being um, integral to the Riemann dynasty, so the Second Empire... Um, but then as we know, and there's all conspiracies about it, like that um, Versa Duche, the potentate of Riemann III, um, so, uh, you know, secretly organized his assassination at the hands of the Morag Tong. But um, essentially what happens is after the Riemann dynasty ends, the Second Era is declared and the it's the age of the, the Second Empire is continuing with the potentates. So they've literally got Sayesi rules. Um, Versa Duche lives for couple of hundred years i think and then and then his son uh severian chorak um also does for a bit and then eventually uh, it's only those two that actually end up ruling but um it's a there's some interesting effects that you don't think about but like with the fighters guild um that's originally a uh Sayesi organization called i think it's the sifim or sifim yeah. or something like that right. something like that um and so basically it was originally just a Sayesi organization there is, I've got to actually find the name. There's a guy, another, anyway, so he implemented the Guilds Act, which affects like all the legislation with things like, um, you know, in the typical guilds, like they could be like cobblers or, or like masons or whatever, but also Fighters Guild and Majors Guild. And There's so some on. other ones as well. Yeah. There's some other yeah, yeah. saucier guilds <laughs> that were enabled by this. <laughs> and, um, but I'm trying to find the Fighters Guild. There's a there's a reference. I forget his name. Because um, it, basically it's a... It'd be in History of the Fighters Guild. That would be it. Yeah. Um, Denarius or Denarius Vess called the Iron. Anyway, basically in the year 320, he came to the Potentate. And essentially he sorted out the, the creation of the Sephim which was the early Fighters Guild. But the idea behind the Fighters Guild originally was because Versa Duche didn't want all of the vassal kingdoms of the empire uprising with their armies and so on. So you're not allowed to have standing armies. He was like, no, nah, that's not happening. Um, and that got people really pissed off because they obviously want to be able to defend themselves or whatever and so on. So basically this whole Fighters Guild scenario is it was founded so that people could hire mercenary armies essentially to um, protect themselves if they feel needed and so on. But also it means that the only standing army is the Imperial Legion. Mm. Um, so it ultimately gives him control. Plus he was skimming a little off the top in tax from the Fighters Guild revenue. So it was also sorting out a, a monetary problem for him as well they're smart but they're smart these snakes yeah because I, I think this, the second empire is really what kind of ad, is the foundational empire for what the third empire is like the first empire is really quite different like mm. with the Elysian yeah. order and so on but the second empire is where it first becomes familiar as the imperials like you know what I mean mm -hmm. but um, yeah and then I guess the, the last part which we can talk about with the, in reference to the Sayasi and all to the Akaviri in general, is um, the famous third, well, first invasion of Akavir. So it's when Uriel V, um, Uriel Septim V, uh, went to um, basically everything was super peaceful, super great, but he wanted um, he wanted to you know make his mark on on the empire, so he went to attack Akavir 
and he conquered a few islands in between, um, Enslay, Slay, um, and Ezreonet, I think. And um, we'll always get cop. We'll always cop shit. Yeah, they're they're sessions. not easy. There'll always be different ones. Yeah. yeah, there's yeah. four of them, yeah. right? Yeah. Does anyone want to take over? I f- feel like I'm talking a fair well, bit. Well, I mean, on... except for the fact it was just pretty much a resounding failure. There, there isn't a great deal to go into. Basically, you know, they established Septimia as their kind of base of operations where they spring out from. And uh, unless I'm forgetting parts, they kind of try to establish cities and, you know, strongholds further along. Yeah. But then eventually they just so, can't hold on to them. I'm pretty sure... Yeah. I'm pretty sure... Um, Septimia yeah. and Ioneth. Yeah, it's Sep- Septimia and Ioneth. And I know that Ioneth eventually was where the emperor put his headquarters because it was larger than septimia and better located and more tactical and stuff yeah i think and it- and, and and i like the idea that they fought there's this this kind of sidetrack thing but there's this theory because they encountered heaps of bad weather and when they took over and they kind of you know had the full presence to themselves they didn't take any like prisoners or anything like that so as far as agriculture goes and supplies they had to kind of do it themselves and if they couldn't manage to kind of do agriculture themselves and feed themselves then they were just going to fail anyway and uh, and and there was really bad weather and there's this idea that perhaps the really bad weather was actually caused by like sciesi magic because they they sent out like um you know people to i I don't know if i'd call them diplomats but basically people to go and communicate with the sciesi and none of them ever returned and they didn't get any messages back uh, originally. I mean, they got attacked <laughs> eventually, but it was kind of like they got scene zoned and they they lost all their messages, messengers and stuff. And then they had all this bad weather that they were dealing with. Like it was just an absolute Well, and as we've already mentioned, nightmare. one of their four elemental deities, was it Ilni, is the god of wev- the weather slash the air. So, mm-hmm. you know. Interesting. Interesting. And also... Um, the uh, ocean one as well, yeah. whatever that was called in Zisa. the play. Because um, it, it's, yeah, it's for sure, like, it's for sure some kind of magic thing going on because that was like, because I'm pretty sure wasn't there even a thing um, in there with his battle mages. They kind of had like broken, the storms were breaking the communication. Yeah, like, it they, they like did. And, and they, com- they communicated by magic between, between yeah, the two cities. And there's even, they talk about going back to Tamriel, I think to communicate something about a battle mage but it didn't i think it was one of the islands that they were like uh, maybe, ferrying transports from prob- like probably or something. probably i think it was like black harbor maybe i can't remember but but basically like this isn't unheard of like big storms have been created by like the sigic order and stuff and i mean they've got there's powerful magic there if you can make an island disappear i'm sure you can some snake men can conjure up a storm or oceans and, and whether that's actually just direct our oh, magic or maybe some of their gods interact they did a there, cheeky like... ki and it uh it's screwed. yeah yeah <laughs> 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 <Hi-ya. laughs> <laughs> it's it's really like yeah i just all i imagine is just like 10 year old kids doing karate in a mcdojo like <laughs> <laughs> kind of like... maybe it's similar to the kind of voices you hear in the uh the intro to Skyrim as well you know like that kind of yeah. the chanting chanting what about yeah. what about Halden in um, in Skyrim when you go to Windhelm and you do the Rise in the East quest when it turns out that there's pirates that are pillaging the different ships and stuff of the East Empire Company I'm pretty sure there was some quote somewhere about their battle mage leader Halden this red guard guy uh, creating like fog or something right i, I just yeah. i just know there are other there are other things yeah. going on there's a hundred percent precedent for all of that kind of um magic but uh yeah in the end it was a big bundle it was all um they stuffed up they stuffed up and uriel the fifth supposedly died. and originally supposedly to- <laughs> well yeah so i think he is dead he's only and some people were asking this question um and I think the only reason he was ever alive was for the potential of, like, Todd Howard's, like, you'll notes. He's like, yeah, maybe it would be a good 
idea him coming back with dragons to Tamriel for a uh, Elder Scrolls V in the des- in these early um, what do you call it? Not design documents because they were just notepads. But <laughs> but anyway, um, I think he, the idea of him being alive is only there if it was going to serve the plot. Oh, for sure. I but think. but I mean like that's he's... that's exactly what Bethesda does. I mean, like Todd yeah, Howard yeah. said for Skyrim, like you said, they were going to have Ural Five returning with an army of dragons to retake the throne. Um, I, I know Elder Scrolls Six would never be in Akavir. At least I I highly, highly, highly doubt it. But I I wouldn't be surprised if if they had some Akaviri invasion. But I don't know if they would have Uriel the Fifth return. It would be interesting to see how that plays out with like a mid dynasty and stuff. But um. It, it yeah, would really, it would it, really shake things up. It would really shake things up. Yeah. So, um, Onan Keenan, who asked that question, a few others did. I just like shouting some people out. Well, you uh, hold on. Sorry. I think it's not likely. Me too. But is he a dragonborn as well? Obviously, like. Well, yeah. yeah. So why didn't they kneel before him? Well, <laughs> because <laughs> he wasn't Reman. I don't know. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of stuff actually with the septums in there, like dragon like they definitely are because they could wear the amulet of kings mm. but then there's a lots of weird kind of yeah i think their powers can fluctuate yeah. somewhat and it's like yeah so it's like not directly um type of septim's blood well, it is his bloodline but it's not his direct descendant it's rather his well, nephew it's, not, it, it's, it's descendant. related yeah. he's only he's only related but there is no none of the septim empire uh, emperors outside of pelagius the first were direct mm. descendants of tiber septim yeah. All of them were direct descendants of Tiber Septim's brother. So so his seed, <laughs> Tiber Septim's seed, did not affect pretty much 99% of the Septim dynasty. So, you know, and, and they all harp on about Tiber Septim and Talos, huh? Yeah, why, why didn't he have more kids? <laughs> but, um, Maybe he spent most of his time at Rim Men or well, something. But <laughs> Pelagius I is actually... <laughs> <laughs> I was like taking that heap seriously and listening. But like um uh, Pelagius the first is actually his grandson. His son Tiber Septim outlived his son, I think. And then his grandson took over from him. Right. Um But yeah, I think that kind of wraps up the Sayesi. Yeah. I think we could move on to um the next to the race. What do we want to do next? Monkey men, tiger, tiger men, or snowman? Which snowman. one? Tiger men last. Snowman. Let's go snowman next. All I right. mean, we can because yeah. we can talk All about right. the, the second Kamal. invasion too. The... All right. Who wants to? Who wants to read their little thing in mysterious? I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. Right. Kamal is snow hell. Demons live there. Armies of them. Every summer they thaw out and invade Tang Mo, but the brave monkey folk always drive them away. Once. Adasum dear Kamal, a king among demons, attempted to conquer Morrowind, but Almalexia and the Underking destroyed him at Red Mountain. I don't know if you want to talk about the little Elder Scrolls Online lore, but... Um. <laughs> I, like, okay, so well, let's talk about them a bit first. So, so there's, we there's basic- no demons. And I yeah. find it really interesting to think of what they look like. We really don't know much about them, and they're kind of the hardest to imagine. They almost don't sound like a race as much as they sound as like creatures. You know how there are creatures that are still sentient, but like they don't have like a civilization with towns and shops and and mm. and worship and temples and stuff. It sounds so creature like to be frozen solid for like all of winter and then thaw out. And every time you thaw out, you're really angry. I mean, I would be angry too, but, you know, and you, and you just want to go in and dominate and kill things, you know? I, I don't know. What do you think they would look like? Would they look kind of more like, uh, I don't think they would look like Frost Astronauts. Would they be like mini cast tags or something? Like, <laughs> what do like you think? I, I've kind of always thought of them actually a little bit more elemental in my head of Thor, but maybe sort of like, actually, you know, the movie Thor, you know, the uh, Frost Giants? in that like they're like those sort of bluey really blue skin and maybe like i still imagine it kind of biological because it's it's said that they freeze like you can't really freeze wa- like a frost atronarch mm. if you melted it it would just be water whereas i imagine them being frozen into something sort of like those mammoths trapped in ice kind of thing and then they thaw out and come and attack oh yeah and i don't know maybe it's some kind of hibernation kind of i can really vibe this when I, i'm just looking right now at like frost giants 
and stuff yeah like you were talking about they yeah you could you could see that something like that 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 it almost looks like daedric in like a bit like a dramora covered in icy stuff or yeah like you could yeah something like that but people in cyrodiil have witnessed them so so the second akaviri evasion like we just said is is uh ada sumda kamal and his uh this story is is one point of contention for me because so originally it was um Helm Alexia and the Underking, and it was sort of like a, you know, a Morrowind just cast them off. But basically, my most hated piece of ESO lore that they've added, and it is lore, like I accept it all. I'm not like, I'm not like, oh, it's not canon. It's 100% canon. I just hate it. <laughs> um, it's the second Akaviri invasion. It's the, st- I just find it super contrived. Um, you know, so there's the whole, uh, it starts off with, what's interesting is, they also invade kind of the same way as the first invasion came about. They, they bypass Morrowind, come down into Skyrim, and then they go back into Morrowind. Um, they were looking for something as well. So they Syria. weren't, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, before I get on a little hate train, well, I guess we could talk about what they are, uh, with the ordained receptacle is apparently what they were looking for. And, and I've, I've, there's plenty of theories, but interestingly, it, could be the eye of magnus just both like landing in that wind helm sort of direction or so on that's only like like a receptacle because it basically just means just, like a, a holy object like an object that has some kind of blessing right. and ordained is just yeah like, it's like what you do yeah. like priests and ministers are ordained when they get into office or whatever well, that's it but a, a receptacle a hollow object used to contain mm. something mm. so and the Ma- Eye of Magnus, if you remember, that was sort of like opening up towards the end when Ancano was doing stuff. But then again, I also then, why bypass that and go straight into Morrowind? I don't know. Like, the only other object I can think of superpower is like Heart of Lorcan, but I don't think that really fits the... I mean, it could be something that we yeah. just don't know exists at yeah. all and, and they I know. I mean, an ordained receptacle uh, true. kind of works as a description for the Numidium, kind of. But but oh, yeah. what, I haven't really thought too much about why it's, they're after it's whatever the, they're after. So it's a bit of a blind spot for me. So, so the part I hate about it is there's basically they come they come to Windhelm. They're they're all attacking. I mean it's just you know fine that's all fine. And then the Nords are are fighting them. But then they start fling towards Morrowind. And then the Nords chase them and so on. I just hate how this is the contrived <laughs> story for the foundation of the Ebonheart Pact. They're just magically right. I, I, I don't believe that the Akaviri were like so crazy cool that they were like beating off um, uh, a combined army of Nords and, and Dark Elves. And I also, they've never really been the best of friends, but whatever, fine. And then there's Wolfarth, the Ash King, who's been summoned up by Joran Shaw. Can, can I, read, they, can I, don't I even... read this? But at the last moment, a phalanx of Argonians joined the fray. <laughs> so so poor and apparently someone apparently the she some got like some vision of the hist and they're like yeah we've got to go up there and help the people that have been enslaving us for thousands of years and then the nords who definitely don't care and it's like is this necessary no black marsh you can live in black marsh no one's conquering it no one can conquer it properly maybe the kamal Stay- can because they're these weird frost demons that actually could obviously not if the difference between them losing was a phalanx of some argonians rocking up i don't know i just it just it sounds so poor to me and before it was so much cooler but like like morrowind has fully powered gods at this point Mm. they don't need it they don't need it like black marsh doesn't need the ebon heart you just can't handle how strong the hist are they probably super powered that phalanx of argonians and sent them up there just like they did with the oblivion crisis and you're mad because argonians Saved the Dark Elves. No. <laughs> it's so poor. It's just the worst write-up ever. I just think I, I, really, I do agree with you. I, I'm just the Ebonheart, pa- the Ebonheart Pact. Um, I understand. It's 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 fine. You can cope with it, and other parts. And I know that there's other explanations as they go. They're like, yeah, we've got to. Yeah, but but, work it, is, together. but it is a cope. <laughs> yeah, it's a cope. It's an absolute cope. It's the worst. Uh, uh, um, like the well, the, anyway, the we're story get of sees all colors. I think is the Argonian who led this charge. It's like it, it's a good story, but as you've just said, the fact that some Argonians 
could t change the tide of battle when you've got the under king you know which is a reference to what mysterious akavir said wolf half was there you got vivek and almalexia involved as well it's like that even it doesn't matter what army comes in <laughs> they didn't really need the help it's like yeah, it's like all of these like godly figures around, but not the Argonian shellbacks are here. Da -da -da -da. Stop, stop. It's so poor. Like you could, even if you wanted to force the Ebonheart Pact, if you wanted to force it, you could write it better than that. Of course. There could be a better explanation for it. And the Dunmer is so like, they're like, yeah, let's just, I ended, they, they kind of like throw you a bone. Like, oh yeah, some houses don't like the pact and it's a bit like rough, but like, I, the the, mod, the Dunmer that you see in Morrowind do not seem like the kind that would just going off how xenophobic and nuts they are. Yeah, I feel like, like even if they got help, they would just be like, yeah, so what? Why would we ally with you? Like, like how do you know that the Argonians aren't just going to attack you? Like, they all just sort of like, I don't know, it seems like they all just sort of fall in and into rank and file and sort of all helped. And I don't know, man, it's just poor... Anyway, back to the Kamal. <laughs> but um, I mean, that is that. There's not that much else about the Kamal themselves. There is the interesting thing here. So um, that the invasion force who survived that slaughter at the invasion. So after the Argonian shellbacks and the Dunmer and the Nord all go, yeah, yay, team, let's kill the Akaviri. The Kamal that survived there actually, um, in, in they go down to um, Rimen. Right. Um, with the uh, other and they unite with a, a bunch of others and, and basically the, apparently during the whole interregnum thing this is before Tiber Septum they attempt to they attempt like a coup kind of thing to try and take the ruby throne um, again but it doesn't pan out obviously and then yeah Tiber Septum comes along so I guess that's like the, but did they did seize pretty... the ruby throne right says Re remnants um, of the Kamal invasion force who had somehow survived the slaughter at Vivek's mm. antlers resurfaced in Cyrodiil, seizing the ruby throne from the successors of the warlord Atrobus. The Kamal yes. was soon joined by the Akaviri of Rimen, who had previously yeah. led to elsewhere to avoid Atrobus's persecution. The Kamal and Rimen Akaviri attempted to rebuild the empire, but their effort was doomed to failure. What I find interesting about that anyway is that the Kamal are attempting to rebuild the empire like they're not as kind of the stories make them sound like necessarily just these crazy ice demons who are just on a path to kill everything. Yeah. So the, the, I think there's a little bit of a, there's a, unless it's just, um, maybe, I don't know if us has got it kind of weird or something, but it says the warlord Atrobus claimed the Imperial throne sometimes between sometime between two forty. 2430 in the reign of the Longhouse Emperors. So that's all before the events of ESO. Mm. But then if you go to the original, which is the first pocket guide or whatever, it says um, uh, this is all during 812 of the second era. Yeah. So like after Atrobus. It's confusing time. I think there's just a, a bit of weird timeline discrepancy. It's just yeah. retcons and stuff, which, which happens sometimes. But... Ultimately, you can take it that they just tried to retake it from before Tiber Septum showed up um, later on. But uh, yeah, that that's the that's the Kamal. Um, I guess next you've got we want to do mm. we want to do the cat folk, the tigers last. So, yeah. So you so got the Tangmo, got... the generous and kind monkey people. So Tangmo translating to the thousand monkey. Isles. You'll notice with a lot of these uh, Akaviri races that their supposed, I guess, nations, if you want to call it that, the places where they live are kind of the same name as the race. It's like yeah. if the Wood Elves lived in Wood Elf. <laughs> it's just, a, yeah. it's a bit odd, but you could kind of bring that down to like, not necessarily what the race themselves would say, but what the Tamrielic historians would kind of make of it or give them the names. You know, it's kind of simpler for them that way to record it all. But anyway, they're meant, there's meant to be various breeds of them, which I find interesting. Yeah, they are all kind, brave and simple. But And many are also very crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Crazy monkeys. Yeah, I know. Uh, there's not too much written about them, to be honest. They don't sound particularly interesting. The only other monkey kind of race I can think of is the Imgar from Valenwood. Mm. Um, but I don't know if they would have anything to do with one another. The smallest little connection. You know how they did say that the Bosma 
um, worship Zen, and then that could be an Akaviri origin god. I don't know. And the Imga are also from Valenwood near the Bosma. Maybe that the Imga are actually from a long, long, long time ago, a split off the Tangmo that came and then also brought that concept of the god Zen. Could be. Could be. And it may be. I mean, we know that Imga, their personality is kind of strange, right? Like they really try and emulate kind of like this high elven culture like with their capes yeah. and stuff and they like really want to like fit in like that i find that really or funny. In, or in or instead on the other hand you've got their prophet that uh is the most anti-elven like yeah yeah, yeah yeah so they but uh, one thing as well those, is yeah. like akavir it says in mysterious akavir that akavir is the kingdom of beasts it's where you know there's no it says no men or mer live in akavir though men once did but um as you said with the imga potentially being related to the tang mo you could also say the same you know, for the Argonians and the Sayesi and the Capotan who we're about to talk about and the Khajiit, which accounts for all the beast races. You know, that there's potential that yeah. they're related and split off groups from a long, long time ago. I'd, I'd indulge the um, Capotan um, Khajiit one more than the other one, just only because, like... Um, well, we can actually talk about that in a second, but the only thing is with the, the Hiss, the Argonians lore and stuff so intertwined yeah. with the hist and so on and and then also that in the annotated anyway that they're referred to as men and like one of the wandering elnafe and stuff like that if they descend from that but um yeah so i guess they're, they're just like you know they've been tried to be enslaved by the csc and so on and and look they, there's not a lot to there's not a lot to say about them so we can start talking about the kapotan but what, what's interesting is is about their origins if we were to look at the Khajiit, and if you were to go their beast race, if you were to do the whole, like, Aldemaris' Tamriel kind of thing, that there were the elven people, and that, like their mythology, which is kind of what I buy into the most, that they were changed by Azura into the Khajiit from elves, then technically they were old Elnafes, their, like, ancestry, right? And the old Elnafes, the idea that they stayed on Aldemaris. Um, and then they weren't wandering and crazy and all the chaos, right? And got split into different lands. Instead, they were on Aldmeris. So what's interesting is if if Kapitan and Khajiit were actually related, like, I don't know, like, are they old Elnafe? But I think by definition, they're kind of not. Yeah, I'd say they were. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what, what I'm saying is I don't think that they were necessarily like elves turned into them. But I, I guess this is the thing too, like, you know, as we know, that the Daedra and Aedra are kind of entities that are recognized by all different beings from, like, you know, at Mora, they had Hermaeus Mora recognized, and, and like, there's all the Aedra recognized in Yakutan pantheons and stuff like that. So, a lot of, like, where do the Aedra and Daedra fit in there? And then, if so, like, you know, I don't know, d did Azura make the Kapotan as well, or something like that? Or was there any sort of, or are they just genetic tiger people? Because all of the other beast races, in uh, in Tamriel at least have explanations so the Khajiit were changed from elves the Hist were like they made the Argonians essentially from like little lizards or whatever or oh, that's the theory whatever but um and you know orcs aren't a beast race beast race but they you know how they all have like a tight like that's where they came from and it sort of makes sense so over there even with the Sayesi you've kind of got the idea these that they were wandering Elnafe like they've that's what they said and so on but the other ones you don't really have the... Um, I guess that's why they call it Mysterious Akavir. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Well, if we, if we want to read the, the Kapotan, so Kapotan is the Tiger Dragon's empire, the cat folk hero ruled by the divine Toshraka, the Tiger Dragon. They are now a very great empire, stronger than the Sayesi, though not at sea. After the serpent folk ate all the men, they tried to eat all the dragons. They managed to enslave the red dragons, but the black ones had fled to then... Potan. A great war was raged, which left both the cats and snakes weak, and the dragons all dead. Since that time, the cat folk have tried to become dragons. Toshraka is the first to succeed. He is the largest, dra largest dragon in the world, orange and black, like a tiger, mm -hmm. and he has very many new ideas. And, a and an important thing to point out there is Toshraka is just an anagram for Akatosh. With um, an R in so it. <laughs> oh, well, with an R, so, so yeah, but... Um, isn't it a cartosh, bro? Huh? But, <laughs> yeah. I see. Yeah. But um, but yeah, it's pretty much just Akatosh jumbled around plus an R. Yeah, I like how Tosh Raka, I say Tosh Raka, Tosh Raka, whatever. First, yeah. Tosh Raka says, is that we kill all the vampire snakes. So the Sayesi. 
Then the dra- th- then the Tiger Dragon Emperor wants to invade Tamriel. Mm. Interesting. Elder Scrolls Six. <laughs> you could see an invasion, an Akaviri invasion oh, in sure. Elder Scrolls Six. I don't think you will see Elder Scrolls Six is set in Akavir. I don't think you'll ever get an Elder Scrolls game set there. There's just so much juicy stuff left to look into in Tamriel, but you could definitely have it. I mean, uh, an invasion, sorry. Like, they always try and have a really big, like, crisis come in that's, like, you know, much bigger than... um, It's it's not like a small mortal affair. Like, if the Civil War was the main story of Skyrim, it would be kind of a letdown. Yeah, So they always try and have something bigger, like, you know the Akavir are coming to take over and all of Tamriel will be doomed. So it fits quite well. It's interesting to look at, like, I like the tiger dragon idea, like kind of like this weird mix, like, you know how a lot of um, Asian dragons or Chinese dragons and stuff kind of have those elements like fur and stuff is used on them a lot more. And it's not just the typical lizard looking ones. Mate, what if, what if um, Tosh I- Raka is just Uriel Septim the fifth wanting to invade Tamriel and retake the throne? <laughs> uh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> tell, Todd, tell Todd Howard that. Um, and uh, interestingly, he has many new ideas. And I don't know what's meant by that. Maybe, uh, cause I like that kind of stuff could be, you could look into that more like metaphorically and so on. And sort of like, you know what I mean? There could be deeper meaning to that. It sounds, it's one of the things that sounds trivial and simple. Like, oh, he has lots of new ideas. But, no, I, I, but I whether that felt quite has deeper meaning when I heard that. Yeah, whether it has some metaphysical implications and, and so or on. Or even ideological like, of like, you know, these yeah. people should be in, like he wants to invade Tamriel and they should have the an empire that- there and be more expansive and not be, you know, yeah. just chilling in Akavir. Although it's been, he's taken a while because there's nothing in Skyrim going on. Like we don't know because this is mysterious. Akavir is written in third era, mm. I think. Um, what's in, or what's interesting is too is is that dragons are strongly associated with time, and this whole like Tosh Raka, and like obviously like or Raka or whatever, him being connected to Akatosh by name and so on. But like. I don't know. It's unheard of becoming an actual dragon. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's a pretty... I don't um, know. What about Martin Septum? Oh, yeah, it's an <laughs> avatar thing. But you know what I mean? Like, That was a comment like, on one of our videos, I remember. I think it was Drew said, like, no mortal has ever become a dragon. And the top comment was, like, Martin Septum intensifies. <laughs> like, I feel like it doesn't. I feel like it doesn't count if it's for, like, five minutes. And then yeah, goes, me like, too. Me too. It's, it's yeah, like it's a, like, that's just, like, a superpower. Yeah. Um, Ty Jordan asked, are the cat people, I get the cup of ton, um, somehow related to the Khajiit? I'm going to say no, I don't think so. Just because the Khajiit, I believe, believe they were the elves, like that they were there. So I, I don't really buy into the idea that. I think without more information about them, there's no way we could say a, yeah. a guaranteed answer. Also throw out there just to like go a little spacier with the, um, idea of it, but because I think we already have Khajiit, people go, oh, tiger people, they kind of just assume them as like the form of, of a Khajiit humanoid. But like from that description there, I'm pretty sure they could not, couldn't they just be actually like tigers? Like I got like sent like 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 rat vibes from them. Yeah, like something like that. Like they could be something like, yeah. Like they don't have to necessarily be that humanoid sort of um, figure. I mean, um, they don't have to be, but is there anything saying that they're not? Yeah, but it's just, it's just the reason, like the, the like the Khajiit, for example, came from elves, so the humanoid form precedent's sort of already there. You know what I mean? Like if they're not some beast, there's just it's the same thing as when they go serpent folk. People like assume, you know, the snake like kind of like features and so on, but you know, we we don't know. But it's like it's not necessarily ruled out. I don't think that they could be. Do you think they like would a last a chance head. though? Like there's a big advantage for a race and like a kind of empire to have hands. But magic, bro. Yeah. That's what uh, but imagine it. imagine tigers like hopping around like breathing fire or something. I don't know. Yeah. It sounds but weird it if they don't cool. have hands. Yeah, but they could, I don't know. Maybe they've got prehensile tails they can use. Right. Like, <laughs> like uh, you know, could be cool. But uh, yeah, I don't know. There, there's... Sayesi are definitely the dominant Akaviri. I'll go run through some extra uh, questions that we've got at the end. Some of we might have already covered, but 
Um, oh, he, here's one from Thomas Holmes. And, and a bunch of other guys are talking about this as well. What do you think Nerevar, I mean, Nerevarine was thinking or wanting to do when he decided to go to Akavir and why? Because remember, he, um, that's where the Nerevarine supposedly went. I think it was from a source from a rumor in Oblivion. Um, the, like just an NPC dialogue thing. So the Nerevarine, who is also immortal, like ageless because of um, the Corpus, um, went off to Ak. Maybe Azura sent him to check out Azura's other children, the Capotan. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I mean, there's, there's. I mean, it's just an it's a no convenient idea. way to get rid of him. Really, there is, there is that tale I, of um the story of Lyrisius, which I guess has mm. Boethia involved, if you want to even believe it being true, with um, Akavir. Yeah, I think that's like a let, like, it's when I read that, it seems pretty like legend kind of sounding, you know? Oh, I mean? for like, sure. Like he goes and the dragon beats him and he climbs on its back with a dagger saying he'll polish the scale. Then it flies around and he's got the dagger in its back and then he gets the dragon to kill all of the Akaviri forces, right? And then I believe he jumps off after the dragon upholds its end of the bargain. And then Boethia saves him by turning him into like a raven. And then he like flies off. <laughs> epic. Yeah, it's, it is epic. <laughs> it's it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's cool. Um, I got, I've got a bit of a whack theory I could discuss. So like Nero, this is kind of referencing the Nerevarine going there and so on. And it's not so much about the Nerevarine, but it's maybe the why. You heard that, like, I, I think I've talked to you guys about it briefly before. Because someone, Mr. Sponge here is asking, did Akavir have any connections with other continents like Lig, Atmora, or Yakuta? To be honest, we don't know at all. But there is this kind of, um, and I, this is coming from my memory. So, there, but there are theories, and I've seen, like, good cases before and evidence for the idea that, like, time is geographical and like even in our own world by the raw technicality of it, it it is because space and time is connected like time runs differently at you know this planet versus here or something like that you know what i mean so depending on gravity and all those factors so that precedent is already there even in like our physics but remember this is a magical like you know you know what i mean this is this is a world where where the sun is not a flaming ball of fire it's a hole in the ceiling essentially where magic is coming in you know maybe this is why so, tosh raka hasn't invaded you're like oh he hasn't done it yet maybe it's only been 10 seconds in akavir man well maybe <laughs> that I, but one one idea is and this is how i was sort of interpreting um all of these different people talking about it is like imagine it's almost like flat earth theory, dude. Like you have to talk about it as a flat earth, but it makes more sense. If you could even imagine it on, you know, Sadakal, like the world skin, like imagine that as the, as the, as the world. Okay. Right? Okay. But as he goes and moves like this, so at the top and bottom at the edges is like down the blow is not as much as known, but there's this idea that time is slow as you go north, like Admora is frozen in time that there's sort of like, that, that uh, this is like outside the boundaries of the snake kind of thing. So the time's not kind of like almost stopping kind of thing. But the idea is, and I've heard stuff before. I can't remember what it's from about Yakuta, Red Guards from previous Kalper and so on. But the Kalper is actually, it's not so much a necessarily like a full destruction and everything blows up and, it, and then rebirth, but like kind of like a gradual kind of thing. So, and there's, and there's characters like Umaril's father that's supposedly from a, you know, the Kalpa's world river and so on. But if you imagine it as a river that's flowing, so you've got Yakuda um, was in the West and everything going to the West is is old time. It's in the past. And then the Tamriel right now is the contemporary and then Akavi is the future. And if you imagine it as a conveyor belt like, or a river or something, and then it's like floating down a river and it's coming this way in time. So it's like the Red Guards kind of fled the last Kalpa kind of coming through. Gosh, mm. this is, this through, is super through space. Into Tamriel. And, but this is kind of how people would, so, so maybe the Nerevarine is kind of going forward into the next Kalpa thing so that when it's contemporary is already, it, dude, it's whack as hell. It's a real space cake kind of thing. I kind of like it Yeah, me it too. It's, it's, it's but, fun to talk about that kind of stuff, but, even though there's not many sources to be like, yeah, this is how it is. It's, 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 a, yeah, it's a cool it's, theory. And it's probably like Lig's probably in there. The idea that he's the adjacent place or something. Maybe he's on the other side of the snake. But I do like the idea of the actual um, being on the serpent 
um, as because you know it's kind of the world skin and so it's on. Like but, that's uh, exactly what I was thinking. Oh yeah, <laughs> you look up yeah. and you just see the snake's head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's kind of like. Because a lot of, they talk about like how cosmology um, and stuff with all of the planets and so on. It's that that's how the human eye sees them, and it's not necessarily how it is. Because in the same way that you see that the sun and, and the stars and so on, like that's how we you visualize those planets. This is this is in Elder Scrolls, not the real world. <laughs> I'm talking about just the Elder Scrolls, um, but yeah, and how that's just how they they sort of. You know how you see the planet Kinnereth or whatever, and how it kind of—it's just to a kind of work for the mind. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, because yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of whack when you. Uh, I bet our listeners anything. didn't expect this <laughs> when they clicked the Akavir podcast. Yeah, well, so yeah, well, that was the question. Like when someone was like, you know, any other connections to that? I don't know. It's a cool theory. I do like the idea going from like west to east, past to present, um, or to future, really. But like. But, but the kind of idea of simultaneously having all times kind of existing at once. And by the way, with dragon breaks and all that kind of stuff, the precedent's there for multiple things happening at once. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, but like also the, the idea that I think it's really interesting that the past and the future are actual tangible real places that you can go. You can like sail to the future or sail to the past. It's kind of cool. But then, yeah. It, it gets nuts, but it, it's cool. It's cool. Some of the out there stuff. Anyways, um, are there any more questions or anything else to say about Akavir? The, la- the last one is from Astabul Rasta, which would be... Because most of the other ones we've covered, but um, is there any evidence of towers active or not in Akavir? So, like, like you know, yeah, Yorokalkum the- Tower in Yakuta, for example, is in Yakuta. I, um, I don't think there's any evidence at all. Possibility could be... But this is the kind of thing with that theory because it's designed to be eight towers and eight hearts. And then, then, so if anyone wants a little like quick thing, there's the idea that the world, everything is a wheel and that there's like these eight spokes and those are the towers which sort of hold up reality and stuff like that. Whereas, and then the, then there's this poetic like little thing with the 16 Daedric Prince realms are like the spaces in between the spokes the Adra. but there's all these extra outlier gods and other things there's potential for more daedric princes there's demi princes all kinds of stuff like it's a neat little it's a cool thing but one I thing i like about the wheel yeah. i can't remember what source it's from but it, it puts the idea of kim quite nicely is that vivek talks about the secret tower which is looking mm. at the wheel from the side when it just looks like a line mm, yeah and that's the secret tower and then that yeah and then that also says mm. i which is like, like i me. like me i'm, I'm real yeah, yeah. yeah. Like ego kind of stuff. It's it's really really cool. Some of that um, crazy stuff, but I think that's pretty much it for Akavir. Yeah. <laughs> as far the as... only the only other thing that I could bring up possibly that's not related to any of that, but I just don't want to leave it out because I think it's really cool. In Elder Scrolls Online, there is this ancient silver mask of Akaviri design, and it kind of looks like a like a metal. You know how the Nords have their dragon priest masks and stuff. It's like a snake version. Like it looks really mm. like serpentine. And oh, cool. I know the I one you imagine. Mean. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine them wearing it. it looks pretty sick. But anyway, speaking yeah. of masks, check out this merch. <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> there we go. We got new shirts. Yeah, they're pretty cool. I was really surprised with how well they turned out. But uh, yeah. Anyways, thank you everyone for watching. We really appreciate it. Uh, we'll have a new podcast coming out soon, as always. We don't know what our next topic is, but it's probably going to be another fun ranking one. But we'll, we'll see. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, we will be back to nerd out with you again next time. See, see you ya. later. Bye-bye.